Good morning. Welcome to Lexington Remembers. Thank you for joining us today, a cold and damp May 4th of 2023, <laughs> as Lexington Remembers continues its goal to capture events, people, and topics that are pieces of Lexington's history. I'm oh, Donna peace. Hooper, and with me today is Paul Ross. We, along with the other members of Lexington Remembers, continue the work of our founding members, Dan Fenn, Jackie Ward, and Bob Edwards. Today, we welcome Ashley Rooney and Peter Lund, each of whom go by their middle names, uh, two longtime Lexington <laughs> oh, wow. residents combined with over 70 year residents uh, and individually experiencing different time frames and aspects of Lexington. And as a married couple, some interesting and shared experiences. <laughs> so welcome to you both, Ashley and Peter. Thanks for doing this with us. My pleasure. Yeah. And today, Paul, you'll start with the Lund family. I'll things. start with the Lund family who began their journey in Lexington in the 1930s. Uh, I note that uh, Peter is a Lexington High School graduate, uh, 1954. Uh, uh, I'm a class of 55, and we just, as a sidebar, we just had a 70th uh, reunion, a luncheon yesterday. So we're all pretty proud of that. There were actually um, uh, 20 people who were able to come, come to it. But back to why we're here. Um, Peter, I would ask you to sort of think about the changes that have occurred in the town from 1943, if you can remember back that far, to the current, to the current uh, date, at time. Well, I can't uh, really remember 1943, but my first memory of Lexington is just after World War II and there was a celebration on the green, and that would have been August of 1945. Oh, and sure. we stood on the uh, driveway going up to Hancock Street and watched the festivities that were happening. So that's my, sort of my first uh, memory of the town of Lexington. But uh, my dad was a roofing contractor, so we uh, got around and about town quite a bit. And we can talk about downtown and diagonal parking and your well, dad's why, story. Why don't you so shoot forth. with downtown as oh. you remember it? Okay, well. And, and certainly diagonal parking yeah. would be an interesting uh, uh, Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Given today's circumstances. But you think of downtown, if you, uh, at least I can recall many a time coming uh, on Waltham Street and into Mass Avenue, and uh, there was a policeman by the name of Joe Bill Castro who used to direct traffic, and he was an absolute expert at getting people to turn left, turn right, and mm -hmm. do it very expeditiously. Uh, but if you turn right on a Mass Avenue, and where the, the corner building has been there, as far as I'm concerned, since forever, but there was a diner that lay on the, up, up, up on the, uh, the right-hand side, up a little bit of a knoll, mm -hmm. and there was a uh, colonial home between that brick office building and the diner. Oh, for heaven's sake. And you had, of course, the next building, which has the, if you look at the front of it, I'm sure you can recall too, but there's a picture of a candle pin. Right. And the bowling oh. alleys were down beneath what was then the first national store. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Then you cross the street, right? Your dad's store? No, it was, for, but thank you for remembering it, but it, no, it was farther up okay. on the other side. So if you were taking a left off of uh, Waltham. Waltham to Ma Mass Ave. Yeah, okay. But what you, you were mentioning, the bowling alley in that, uh, the, where was the first, first national, yep. and then you follow it down to, um, Viano's. Viano's um, Buick dealership. Yes, yes, wow. of course. Just, yep. Yeah, yeah, and their residence was on. Uh, didn't they live across the street from you? Mm -hmm. Oh, was that a different Viano? No, it's all part of the family, okay. but uh, and it was why uh, quite varied and extensive. So I don't know which branch of the Vianos yeah. lived on Vinebrook Road. Okay. But uh, it was very, they're very impressive because they owned a lot of real estate going all the way up to Muzzy Street. Because mm -hmm. one of the members of the Viano family owned that brick building on the corner of uh, Mass Avenue and Waltham Street. Oh, all right. That right, going on the right hand corner, yeah. Sure. Talk yeah. about the store where you watch the television. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, Troop 19, 
Lexington Boy Scouts of America, uh, was housed in uh, Hancock Church. So on Tuesday evenings, all of, not all of us, but those of us who lived on Farm Crest Avenue or down that way, mm -hmm. uh, down Waltham Street past Merritt Road, we walked to and from uh, Hancock. But we would stop on Tuesday nights in front of Smith's Paper Store, which was a building, it's gone mm -hmm. now, and he had a TV in his front, uh, in his front window, and mm -hmm. we'd watch the show of shows. <laughs> and then we'd continue on our way home. Sure. But you mentioned walking, which was uh, a preferred or a typical way of moving about, which wouldn't happen today as much with kids, you know, have, who have cars. Yeah. Right. We, were, we were a bicycle walking culture. Yeah. Absolutely. Com Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You were on a bus route too, Peter, weren't you? Uh, what were yes. the major bus routes at that Let's time? Let's see, yeah, the Middlesex and Boston, which was running between, well, they were in, at least from Lexington Center over to Waltham, down Waltham mm -hmm. Street. And of course, Waltham Street back in those days was the original Route 128. Okay, so anyway, uh, down Waltham Street uh, and cross Marrow Road and Farm Crest Avenue was up to the left. And yeah, we did a, we did a lot of walking. Yeah. Were there other buses? And the other bus, oh, now the other one was Hanscom came, Field. Came, one came from Maynard. It was the white bus line, which came down Route 2A. So at the intersection, there was this bus stop at the intersection of uh, Mar uh, Marritt Road and Kendall Road going up over the hill. And my mother would take the bus, the white bus, to Arlington Heights to shop on Fridays. Oh, for take the, And if you wanted to go to Boston, at least from our part of town, you got the white bus to Arlington Heights and you took the trolley to Harvard Square and that's the Boston as your... You know, as you, in those days, you could, you got a transfer, right? You, so you I, could go from one to the next at the yes. same. If it was, the, but not between the white bus and the M, or the T at that point. But yeah, or within the T, yeah, there was. A, I think all there was a transfer. time when the white bus would go directly to Harvard Square. That could be. Yeah, that could be. I remember particularly going, you know, going to the Heights. Right. Yeah. That was a big trip. <laughs> so having originally. Uh, in your early years, you were raised in Arlington, so your mother yep. still had a center of operation out of the Heights, more yep. than Lexington Center, yep. per se. I think it was convenience as much as anything. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, what, what happened is my she would take the bus, do the shopping, and then my father would come out of Boston yeah. and uh, pick her up at a prearranged place. In fact, it was in front of the First National. <laughs> what was it Arlington like Heights. to be a kid in Lexington? What are some of the memories that you may have? Well, I gave you the one uh, with the Boy Scouts, which was kind of neat. But we would... Talk about the tell... biking that you did. The, the which? You talk about biking and going all the way up to the North Shore and stuff on your bike. Well, that's, yeah, okay. Well, we'll get to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, just uh, something that comes to mind. Well, we go to the biking down the North Shore. Freddie Hanley, who was the uh, son of the rector, of uh, Reverend Hanley, Reverend Hanley, yeah. the yeah. Redeemer, the, uh, Church Redeemer. Redeemer. Yep. Well, Fred and I were real buddies, and we both had English-style bikes. And on Sunday afternoons, or Sundays during the summer, after church, we would ride our bicycles from Lexington to Swampscott. Wow. And My we would word. have Sunday dinner with with Fred's grandparents, who had immigrated from England, and then we visit with them and generally we came back at night. Mm. So I, you know, you can equate that with a lot of uh, granted freedom and trust on the part of our parents. Did you have lights on your bike? Uh, yeah, we did have lights on our bikes, but it was still below, you know, it was still yeah. dark. Yeah. And yeah. We, we would come back. Yeah, that was a good, oh, I guess it probably took, it was 12 miles. It probably took us an hour to an hour and a half to, to make the trip. That but there was the old 128, as a matter of fact. Went over, weave through Reuben and down town of Swampscott. It was Do you remember the impact of the new 128? I... You saw it go up. Well, yeah, that's a good reminder. There were a group of us that had English bicycles, and we uh, took it to, I think we were 2A and, uh, right. and, and 128, and we watched Paul Dever come down the road and when the highway was open. 
And of course, it was obsolete the day it opened. Who was Paul Dever? He was the governor. Okay. Paul, governor yeah. Paul Dever, yeah. Why was it obsolete the day it opened? They only made it two lanes and a breakdown. This is 128, this as we is know. This is 128, it. and then it really needed for openers three lanes and a breakdown. So okay. basically, the traffic was always, in my in my opinion, in my observation, was always a problem. That's interesting. Yeah. I hadn't I hadn't known that. And of course, Ashley has a has done some stories on the impact of 128 on on the town of Lexington and sure. surroundings. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is kind of. It, kind of interesting. It kind changed of, the character of the town. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah absolutely. Very much so. That in the Burlington Mall. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and of course, there is a story that goes around that the Burlington Mall could have been in the, uh, could have been in Lexington or, or mm. anyway, in one of the old sand pits on, in Lexington right. off of uh, Adams Street. Yes, it was supposed mm. to go right through yeah. what we now yeah. know as the town. Yeah. Uh, it was turned down a few times at, at, by town meeting, yeah. I think, because I know there was one time it was before town meeting for Spring Street at Route 2 where okay. yep. Raytheon ended up going in. Right. Oh, that yeah. was going to be the site yeah. for the Burlington Mall yeah. as well. Yeah. And of course, in our, our youth, that was one of Swenson's uh, dairy farms, that whole hillside. Sure. On Spring Street. Yeah, yep. yeah. Sure. And the other um, part of the Swenson Brothers Milk uh, Company or milk business on was on Merritt Road and Farmcrest Avenue, where we lived, you. overlooked it. Oh, and we watched the uh, we watched uh, that building or that barn burn down. Did I hear you correctly that there were two Swensons? It was Swenson Brothers Milk. Yep. And I think they were in collaboration with the, the two farms. Ah. I think. Okay. I think. Yeah. Do you remember the farm as much in growing up? Well, one fun thing about the farm is we would the. Um, foreman for the farm had his residence or an apartment and the building is still there above a multi-car garage right yeah. and that's, that building still stands a anyway but because of that connect we could play in the hayloft above the cow barn <laughs> which we did oh uh, that's great and then of course the other uh thing which uh was very soothing let's put it that way to our parents was there'd be enough rainwater would collect during the winter in the fields, and it would probably be to a depth of about six to eight inches, and it would freeze solid. So uh -huh. our parents were much keener on us going down there to skate rather than going up the Different old ways. res on Marin Road, mm -hmm. which was considerably deeper, and they always worried about falling oh, through yeah. the ice. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about play? Because it's very different today. Oh. The lessons learned. <laughs> the lessons learned on pickup football games and pickup baseball games. Yeah. And if you, uh, well, one of the places we had pickup football games was when the golf course was on uh, on uh, Concord Avenue, uh -huh. and we'd play football in the fall on the on the fairway, and nobody objected to that. Sure. And then if you come down Waltham Street, take a left on Concord Avenue, the other little mini apartment complex, and next to it is a, is a brown residence. Well, on a hill above that was a field, and we played baseball, and we could get enough kids around that we had two full teams of nine, nine each. Mm. Wow. And there was, a, there was a chicken farm up there, too. Can't for the life remember who did the chicken farm, but it, or who owned it. But it'll right. come to me probably after we leave. The, that's the Canizzo property now, though. Could well be, has, yeah, 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 yeah. Talk about the muskrats. <laughs> <laughs> Prompting me. Uh, back in the day, you could get a trapping license, I think, at age 14. And I think it probably cost you all of 14 or 15 bucks. But a couple of us used to trap muskrats on a very regular basis. Oh. And the trap line I ran was on the brook beside Brookside Avenue, which and Brookside led up to what was then Franklin School, and is now the what is it? I can never remember. The apartments Franklin yeah, 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 on yeah. Allen Street. Yeah, so there's a brook that runs right beside Brookside Avenue, obviously, and I had a trap line that ran in there. So what did you do with the ones that you trapped? Did you have them skinned and well, whatever? Well, we did that. In <laughs> did you yes. let them go? Trap, trap, trap the muskrat. Uh, when it was dead, you skinned it and put it in a, in a uh, stretcher. So it was about so like that, and the stretcher was like so. 
Oh my word! And uh, we would take them to Boston, take the <laughs> the white bus to, to, to Arlington Heights, and take the, the trolley to Harvard Square and so forth. And we'd sell the pet, the uh, the pelts to I.J. Fox and or a couple of other ferries that oh, ferries wow. that would borrow them or wow. borrow them. And did it have them. a fairly furry? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was in, in essence. It was. It could be. I think we used to refer to it. it was phony. It was phony beaver. Yeah. Oh. Okay. okay. That was, was a big deal here in Lexington. Yeah. I've done an article on that yeah. one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, going way back as a matter of fact, yeah. way back. Uh, way back. Yeah. Okay. But we could get, depending upon the quality of the pelt, we'd get anywhere from three to five dollars each. So if you had ten ten pelts, that was pretty good money in those days. Wow. So then my. That kept you busy and out of trouble. Well, yeah, I got up early in the morning, too, to tend the traps before you went to school. Wow. <laughs> and then you got enough money, you, you said, to buy a nice... Well, what we'd do when we sold the, when we sold the pelts, we'd go into, uh, well, it wasn't, one of the five and dimes on uh, Tremont Street in Boston. Uh -huh. And we'd have ourselves a feast of a couple of hot dogs and, <laughs> yes, and a soda and order of French fries. And that uh -huh. was probably all of a buck or a buck and a quarter. Wow. And then we'd come on home with our, with our pockets loaded with... With money, that's a wonderful. a lot of money for us. You know, day. Those days. Yeah, that's yeah, a that's a great stuff. that's yeah. a great memory. I'm struck by your saying that you could get lots of kids very quickly to do certain yeah. things, and I yeah. I suspect you can't do that today because kids are so scheduled or involved in other activities or not even just absent. Right, you know, the whole neighborhood cluster. Yep, would, uh, yep. yeah, it was a pickup games all the way. Yeah. And it was a great le lesson to be the ninth person yeah. chosen. And you went to the youth group at Hancock Church. Yep. Was, there uh, were youth groups in those days. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There was one. Well, there were there was one at Redeemer. Mm. There was one at Hancock, and there was probably one at the Unitarian Church. There was probably one at the Baptist Church. There definitely was one at the Catholic Church. Uh, but one of the uh, things with the well, the youth group at, at Hancock was where, in high school at least, where the action was, and it's. Uh, you know, it was a boy girl thing, let's face it. And that's where the action was. So, a boy Hancock girl, Church, it was. A boy just, girl thing being what? The men were chasing, the, the boys were chasing the girls. Oh, oh, and that's okay. where they were. Yeah. <laughs> Informal dates. Did yeah. you have dances? Not at Hancock Church per se, but we could get into uh, promenaders. Yep. Which was started when in the early 50s, because it was very much on a, in existence when when I wasn't in you were in, yeah. Yeah. in high school. And Explain was the what Belfry that is. Club then Pat was active at that point. Belfry as Club well. was also active and Russ Morash uh, was active in the Belfry Club. Selden Loring's father played uh, oh boy. The big giant the Broadway <laughs> show with the the punker Rabbit, son of a gun. I can't remember the name of the show. Yeah, but there was a very yeah, active. Was that a, basically it was a social organization? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Mm. Yep. 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 What promenaders? No, no, no. Now we're all with the Belfry Club. Yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, and they they leased the place. So we I did, oh, some Belfry Club shows and some high school stuff and all. They would have uh, Miss you. Merrill's dance class. Exactly. On, exactly. On <laughs> <Friday>. <laughs> And you and learn all how the to girls do a proper would sit around this perimeter, <laughs> and all the guys would sit around that side, and somehow it all came together. Yeah. But yeah, that was that was. It was interesting orchestrated. Time. Yeah. 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 So interesting, so. interesting time. Yeah. I think, on balance, I think our parents gave us uh, a lot of freedom, and it was a lot of trust that we would, uh, you know, that, goof that's right up. That's an interesting concept. A lot of freedom and a lot of trust yeah. because we read today about helicopter parents, which is a very different uh, That's concept. A different. Definitely not helicopter parents when we rode our bikes no. <laughs> to, to Swampscott at the age of 14. <laughs> <laughs> but there was you also, a lot of safety and, and trust and, yeah. and parents didn't have to worry about kids getting into real trouble or being at risk. Well, basically. you know darn well if you did, you were in trouble when you got home. <laughs> also the neighbors. Right, because oh, the yeah. neighbor, if you did anything wrong, the neighbors would say it, something to your parents. So, so we're going to pause with you. You graduated high school and spent some time out of town. Uh, yeah, I, my probably my legal address was uh, until 1963, when I, my first wife and I were married, uh, was 
Farmcrest Avenue in Lexington. Mm -hmm. But my first wife and I, we uh, were looking for a home in Lexington, and it was too expensive then, so we Ooh. bought a house in Bedford. <laughs> so that's so, why he married me. Yeah, get back, <laughs> get back in town. So there was no question when we married, yours, mine, or ours in terms of a home. Sure. I'm going back home. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah. So nice. appear, then appears Ashley. Your family came to Lexington in the early 70s, I believe. Yeah. Um, so what, if you can share with us, Ashley, what brought you to Lexington? And, and really then, how did you share your interest and passions with the community um, to benefit your needs as well as community needs? As I had well? moved my mother-in-law um, from New York up to Bedford where I was living at that point and she couldn't live alone and so <clears throat> we moved her into our tiny little house in Bedford and I said we couldn't live that way we had I had two children the house was small and um so I looked for a house and I knew Lexington and had fallen in love with Hancock Street going back and forth here to uh, Lexington to my obstetrician and Hancock Street at that point was it was G covered with green. The mm. big trees were there and they arched oh. over. It was a beautiful street. Uh, most of those trees are now gone. And of course, there's so much traffic. They Growing a tree like that is very hard these days there. I've tried several times, it didn't work. Anyway, there was this house on Hancock Street that it was a derelict house. It was a mess. The family was divorced. They left in anger. I found the wedding pictures, the baby pictures, the toothbrushes and everything under the old claw-footed bathtubs and so <laughs> forth. Um, and <coughs> we bought the house and we moved in when my children were quite young. They were, uh, the oldest was five at that point. And my mother-in-law quickly discovered I was meeting a lot of English people here in Lexington. For some reason, there were a lot of English at that point. And I wasn't enjoying them. And but because she her Irish background and what she remembered from the Irish Rebellion in 1918, she was terrified of hearing those voices. Mm. So we made a deal and I could go back to work and she would empty the dishwasher and be there when the kids came home from school and I was off to work and it was great. And so my life changed at that point. And I lived there for quite a few years. I had different jobs. I changed in the jobs. And um, eventually I ended up working here at home. I had sold a, no uh, sold a novel, decided to continue writing more novels, which didn't sell at all. Um, and my children were teenagers and it was a good time to come home to keep an eye on what was happening. And I got involved with youth groups here at um, Lexington and then in Winchester. Um, and so I was working with the youth for 20 years there and then my husband died. And I was living on Hancock Street and Peter and I knew each other um, from a mutual friend. And we bumped into each other. No, I led a trip to Tanglewood and he was on it. Mm. And, and the movie was, they played on the way back was Amadeus. Uh, and neither oh. one of us watched it. And oh. it was six weeks after my husband had died, and it was so nice to be able to talk to somebody about what I had gone through. We were both cancer um, survivors of, of our parents, from our husbands and wife. <coughs> and does somebody understand what you've been through? Um, grief mm -hmm. is a hard thing. And when people say, well, I know what you went through. My father died. It's not the same as losing a spouse, a partner. Anyway, so that was great. But I didn't see him the rest of the summer. I was working, et cetera. It turned out he was driving up and down the street hoping to see me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there were a multitude of ways to get from Bedford to Lexington and my parents' house on Farmcrest Avenue. And that was one of the ways. So I take that on a fairly regular basis when I went to <laughs> visiting my parents, particularly on Sunday evening. He had been widowed for about two years. Yeah. And um, yeah. one day he caught me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I came home from working a used toy sale in Winchester with all the kids. And I was dirty and sweaty and worn out. And there was this man who I yeah. kind of thought was, I had had an interesting conversation. I liked the conversation very mm. much. And we started seeing each other. And by um, Valentine's Day, the next year, we knew we wanted to get married. 
Uh, right. We had similar interests. The reasons to get married or a second marriage is very different than your first marriage. Um, often, the, what things can you do together? We had, between us, five aging parents at that point mm. and five children and two dogs. <laughs> Um, and he was going to move into my house because that way he got back into Lexington. And he likes antiques, and the house is an antique. It's 1830. Um, yeah. Beautiful house. So, thank yeah. you. Um, Can I jump in for a minute? And, and uh, you have a significant number of community activities, things that you've done and you've enjoyed doing. Is there a favorite, or do they all have their niche for you? Well, I love writing for the Lexington Times. Yeah. Writing is but that's something. But it's fairly recent. Excuse me for interrupting. No, I'm I've sorry. been writing for years. Oh, all right. <laughs> sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> no, you I can wrote. Edit I wrote out. for other newspapers <laughs> before I wrote for the Le now Lexington oh, Times. Okay. Um, so that, for me, as somebody said when they were house guests, that's kind of how I restore myself: is go writing something. Oh, okay. And I'm often looking for subjects such as the one you recently gave me. Right. Um, I love gardening, and that was one thing that brought us together. Um, we so also you, you participated in the Lexington Field and Garden Club yes. yeah, actively be, for many, yes. many years. You yes. were more recently its president. So you're very active and committed to oh, yes. that organization and what it stands for. Very much so. so yeah. And the library. And the library. Oh, though I wouldn't be here if it weren't for that library. That library is fantastic. Help um, us with that. Because I did. <clears throat> After I married Peter, I got into writing books. I had right. always written, now I got into writing books. In those days, the, the computer wasn't that great. Well, this was 19, uh, 2001. Early, early 2000s, yeah. And um, the computer wasn't that great. You really didn't have Wikipedia and so forth. So you had to go research out books. And the librarians at that library were magnificent. They still are magnificent. And I can go in with, I'm, look, I'm trying to find, and boy, do they find it for me. They are wonderful. And now, now I have computers and I have Wikipedia and all the other things that we're mm -hmm. gonna have. You can find it, but without the Lexington Library, life would be very sad in my life. Yeah. It's one of the remarkable uh, institutions of the town, I think. Oh, yes. And, and it's recognized beyond the town as being a go-to library. Oh, it's, yeah, I think it's number two. Really? In the yeah, state. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when I worked in Winchester, all the Winchester kids would come to the Lexington Library to do their research oh. because it is so good. Yeah. Um, so the library, yes, um, I've been very involved with the church. Um, not as much now, though I do their gardening for them. Um, it's got a lot of gardens there. Um, and now I've gotten involved in the town committees. Right. So yeah. Can you... the town celebrations, which has oh. been great fun. So, I mean, even though Patriot's Day was cold, wet, and rainy, it was, and I was riding around that golf cart, and it was fascinating to see that parade come together and to realize a group of volunteers runs that parade. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And as volunteers, we're not that young. Um, <laughs> you know, and there we are, out of the golf carts, doing our thing. And it was like, wow. This is, this is wonderful. And to see it all come together like a great big collage coming and you see the picture finally, and there it is. Sure. Um, I'm also involved with Lexington Council of Arts, um, which is, I didn't even know existed in this town, but I've been trying to bring that into the forefront with a newsletter and things like that, and it's now getting more money, and mm -hmm. we just got a cultural district in town, so a lot is happening with that. Um, so that's been very exciting. I can't some of those subcommittees that you've been involved in, the uh, particularly the World War One and World War Two, oh, yeah, did I, those fall within town celebrations, or they were or kind some of, of them a, independent? It was. I'm never quite sure where they fell in. Yeah. Um, it was the Lexington Historical Society and George Moda and so forth. Yes, I did the publicity for them and a lot of interviews for them. Um, there was something else I just thought of. Oh, I'm now on the Lexington 250th publicity group mm -hmm. there. So your your talents for writing uh, have led to your roles basically for publicity, communications, marketing, that type of, that's the niche kind of that you've fallen into for many of these organizations. Yeah, I think it also was true with the kids. I realized what I like to do 
is get somebody else out there. Let them shine. Let them be beautiful. Let them grow and become a leader. Um, it's hard these days. You know, if we become strong leaders on our own, you don't have leaders growing up. Right. Mm -hmm. you need, my role is to be a mentor to grow up right. those leaders. Yeah. And so some, you've, you've summarized it before as um, basically, I mean, serving those roles is a lot of um, issues to deal with and that you, you pretty much said you don't see things as barriers, but you see them as opportunities. Even mm -hmm. I guess you could take that piece about letting the kids shine, you know, right. an mm -hmm. opportunity to you don't need to shine. You, you, you want other people to develop mm -hmm. and as right. your role as a mentor. Right. Do you do things as, a, as joint efforts or are most of the things that you do separate? Peter's thing and your no. thing. Peter has given up on committees. He said, we married. He said, I don't do committees anymore. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Been there <laughs> and done that. But he okay. supports me in many of these like um, saying that um, we grow the dahlias for the plant sale for the garden club. I wouldn't know how to grow dahlias without Peter's help. And now he just sort of stands and I bring other people in and we're growing, okay, we have 70 dahlias in someone's greenhouse at the moment. That, wow. uh, mm. You know, we potted in my ancient ba basement and so forth. Um, he would often reviews my stories, especially my newspaper stories mm -hmm. and things like that. Sometimes when I'm having, you know, we're trying to do the um, publicity for Patriots Day, I was trying to work in some history. Mm -hmm. um, not just say, here the clowns, but this is what Patriots Day is about. And so he will read those stories. A new neighbor said to me, why don't we have Patriots Day? <laughs> so writing that article, which a lot of people commented on, I needed his help because he really studied American history. I mean, I knew it as most people do, but, um, now, people really want to know these things and know what it's all about. So, so, so this gets us to the Ashley and Peter team, yep. and and you really do operate as a team, yeah. both personally but out in the yeah. community. Right. Um, one supports the other. You, what you might be leading one initiative, and Peter serves. Yeah, that's as where a I was supporter. going. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then Peter might have an initiative that you're helping him to. Um, you mentioned before about your more recent uh, involvement, well, I shouldn't say recent, really, Lex RAP, the Refugee Assistance Program. Is that oh. something that both of you... Um, right, but I haven't been as deeply involved with them. Right. Um, we were very involved with one Iraqi refugee for quite a while and got involved in getting that group going and writing a story and so forth. Truth, um, truth be known that one of the founders of that group is sitting right there, hmm. right there. Well, I just, said, well I, went, I just had to point out Lexington needed to do something. Yeah, well, we, you also contacted uh, the people who've been down that road, like yeah. in Bedford and so yeah. forth, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and got them to be together right. through the church, or yeah. using the record of the church as sort of the, the pull, pull factor to get them involved. You, you just got to, when, when if you can't find the opportunity, you've got to find open a door somehow. Right. And that's what a lot of his life is about, is finding that door that you can open or making that door so you so can get through it. So then that takes us to the growth of Lexington as a community and how mm -hmm. it's changed over time since the days right. your family arrived, Peter, even mm -hmm. since the day your family arrived. Right. Um, and the, the great diversity that we now find within the town. and. Mm -hmm how um, diversity really, a combination of immigration, assimilation, the diversity now creates a sense of community. Can right. you speak to that at all? And basic, basically how you see that as we're moving forward. I think that's, you know, from years past to now here we are and the opportunities for Lexington as a community as we move forward. I think there are many opportunities for Lexington. Um, I, I was sort of distressed when I saw the editorial in the Globe once we had passed the new zoning law that they emphasized that we don't have many blacks here and that we don't have many Latinos. And then I saw an article on Greenwich, Connecticut, which I know I grew up in that area, and that Greenwich doesn't emphasize that. Greenwich talked about 35% of its people were born in foreign lands. 
And I find meeting all these people from foreign lands fascinating and getting to know it. I think for some people, for Peter, it's a shock in a way. His town has really changed. But I moved here from New York where there were many differences. And I love getting to know these Asians and so forth. I have someone coming to my house today. She is from Asia, showing me how to work a particular thing on the computer. It becoming friends, it's learning a lot. Mm -hmm. um, my recent birthday, I celebrated with a Chinese friend and Chinese and Americans. My daughter came along and she was fascinated by the conversation and the differences. Mm -hmm. We ended up talking about the tools that people use to eat with. Mm. And Siobhan said, my daughter, how do you cut this bok choy? You don't have knives. And the Chinese woman said, we have very sharp teeth. See, you Americans don't have sharp teeth. We use our teeth. It's very different. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I, I was like, wow, I've never thought of it that way. <laughs> but it's learning these differences makes us richer. And we can grow that. I um, mean, for our 250th celebration, I was listening to Concord and thinking, what do we have that's different? Okay, we had the shot that was fired. They have the bridge. But we have this great, diverse community where our children are going to learn how to deal with many different religions and cultures and so forth. Concord doesn't have that. Um, so I think it enriches us in our world. It can be difficult for people to learn the differences. Well, um, it takes time. It takes time. And mm -hmm. it's what we, um, we, ha we have very suppl short supply. There's a phrase that says the, the best luxury that you have is time. Right. Right. And, and, uh, and we tend, as a culture, maybe not Lexington, to be slow to adopt, to uh, be thorough to examine everything right. and and that plays into the to, to time right. actually right so our children will do better you're still That's here a good point. and you raised your families here um, and you re, you united in the late 80s ish 90 ish um, so what's going to keep you here or are you going to I mean, it seems as if you're committed to Lexington. We're You've mentioned, to Lexington. Oh, yeah. mentioned the library is a critical um, opportunity for yeah. you to access and resource. Um, like many of us, we would hope to die in our own home, yeah. right here in Lexington. I cannot see anything yeah. else. And it is obviously um, sort of scary as you get older, thinking, what's going to happen? Where am I going to be? And as we watch our friends age and we think, and I lose, have lost many friends now going off to the different places they're going or to Alzheimer's or to death, thinking, hmm. Um, so it's a new voyage for us if you wanted to, you know, mm -hmm. how we're going to live. But I keep thinking, I didn't mention, I have several foster kids and all that. And one of them came to me through the youth groups. And he was tough. He was rough. The police all knew him. He was not an easy kid. And he changed and he grew and he worked, became number four in the Department of Justice. Mm. And I'm thinking, he changed his world. And I was part of that. Mm. Mm. And my first husband was part of that. And we all can change. It's being open to change and mm. saying, okay, our world is changing. How can I go with it? And that happens to us as we get age, too. We need to change as we face that. How profound. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and people say, oh, you know, how is Lexington today versus when, when I used to live there or when yeah. I grew up or whatever. Well, the world has changed all around us. Yeah. And every town changes, too. Right. Um, and to yeah. seize the opportunities for that. Yeah. At a, at a high school reunion of ours, was probably, I don't know, whatever number of years ago. But Donnie Chisholm was still alive. Yeah. And he was a classmate. Mm -hmm. And he uh, wound up, volunteered, I'm sure, to sort of give everybody a tour of, to what us, was the new high school. And it always will be, because it opened in the fall of 53, and we were the first graduating class in 1954. But anyway, Don had organized this tour of the building. 
And he said, as he was introducing the kids that were going to do the tour, he said, you know, when we were kids, I mean, you know, the differentiation was you were Protestant, but you were Catholic. Mm -hmm. That's it. He said, now take a look around here right now and these tour guides and see yeah. the diversity. And this is maybe 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I said, that's kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah. And I think that was kind of an interesting lesson for those who came from afar back yeah. to Lexington to see, yeah. oh my God, yeah, it has changed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or to go to other towns and see how extremely white they are. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Any other memories that you'd like to raise with us today well, that have you've to, have thought to, have, about? I have, have, have to go with the, my story about the library. My father was a roofing contractor, right? Yeah. And one of our customers was Cary Memorial Library. And as I recall, the, the uh, headlight, well, the librarian was uh, Mr. Uh, Nason, Ralph Nason. So we did business with him because I think the funding for the library didn't come through the town. It came directly. Some of the, it was. You no, know, the t red tile roof yeah. in the front, yeah. which was taken down with the renovation, or was taken down and put asphalt shingles, and then the red tiles were put back on again. When the red <coughs> tiles were there originally with the original building, to, you know, over time, some of it would need to be replaced. So we did the replacing. But to save the town money, what we did was go back in the roof of the library where you couldn't see the roof. We'd pull a red slate out of there, put it where it was going to go in the front where it could be seen, and then put a black, black one just to keep the waterproof. Mm. Oh, wow. Mm. Anyway, I think we saved the town a little bit of money. Mm. <laughs> yeah. that was Yankee young. ingenuity, right? <laughs> Yankee ingenuity. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Any other yeah. thoughts, Paul? No, I, um, I always have the question about the favorite memory or the favorite part of what keeps you here. But I'm hearing uh, Ashley with the, you know diversity and the variety of things, um, and so I think I think we're good. I do have a question, and it may not have anything to do with what we're talking about. The, I've always wondered why the Lexington Field and Garden Club mm -hmm. was ca called that as opposed to the Lexington Garden Club. Well, it seems to me field and garden is a bit repetitive. Because remember, it was, it was formed in 1876. Oh, I so didn't know it, that. So it is facing its 150th anniversary, yeah. two years from now. And in those days, there were many fields. And one of the stories that I love that I wrote up in the yearbook is that oh. as they were trying to, when it was formed because of the centennial that was happening. Uh -huh. And the people were upset about how messy the town was and they knew Grant was coming to town and they had to clean up Lexington oh, because word. they had that messy railroad depot and so forth. And so these guys got together and they did it. And they cleaned it up a bit for Grant and so mm -hmm. forth. Of course, that whole thing was so wild. I don't think he even noticed whether it was whatever. But um, a couple of years later, I think it was in the 90s, the, they still wanted to clean it up and they offered the town money if they could clean off the common, get the cows off the common and get the hay stopping growing in the, and the hay was growing in the common too for the cows. And so the Lexington Field and Garden Club cleaned that up. They were worrying always about the fields. Sure. Lexington was a town of farmers. Yes, I knew, I knew yeah. that. Concord was that court town. Yep. yep. You know, it was a very different town. So sure. that's where it came. Now it's a big mouthful. Anytime I have to write publicity for them, it's Lexington Field and Garden Club. Right. You know? Oh, I knew you'd know. And, yeah. and when I started the question, I thought to myself, Oh dear, this is really off subject. Well, but that's I'm all right. Glad, but can, I'm glad I asked. It. it was at the end. Actually, <laughs> they can cut that all off. Uh, yeah. That well, was fine. Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing your perspective over what comes to be almost 80 plus years, I guess, yeah. if you look yeah. at it. I think it's been a very rich exchange. Yeah. Thank you. And your, love, you. your real love for the community and um, how you, I mean, you're, you're here for good. Uh, looking into the future too. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing with us.